Hey, Keith Van Wimmer here at Van Tech Consulting. During trainings, I get asked a lot um, about what makes a good copper pair for DSL. So, you know, folks are out there, they're testing, they're not sure what they're looking for. So what exactly makes a good pair? Obviously, a good pair is one that tests good. But the testing that you're doing, if you don't understand what the meter's telling you, is really not going to do you any good at all. So these meters, I mean, they're they're great meters. They're the eyes and ears into the copper, so to speak. But they're only as good as your interpretation of the results or understanding the results. I thought today we would go through and I'd actually do a test on a good pair of copper so you could see what it actually looks like. And we'll kind of talk about it a little bit and maybe in future videos we'll delve into the different uh, tests um, that we're running. So on our website, on the Vantech website, there is a uh, checklist here and you can go to there. It's under the uh, training tab down under copper um, and there's a link for this and it just gives you a, a kind of a sanity check and some recommended values that we found works for our customers for uh, basically getting getting stable circuits and alleviating uh, chronic issues. So let's go ahead and get through this. Now I'm using a uh, an Onyx 580, a One Expert 580. Um, it's by Viavi, it's our favorite meter. Um, not an endorsement in any way, shape or form, it's just what we use, we don't get paid to, or given equipment or anything like that. So again, full disclosure there. This guy here is, uh, if you've watched some other videos, this is a fault loop simulator. It is 1900 feet of copper in here. So this has 1900 feet of Cat 5E in it. Um, it also is a, uh, the Cat 5E has a shield or a drain wire in it. And that's what they use to represent the shield on our outside plant. The results, and the numbers may be a little bit better on some of the tests just because this is category 5e cable and it is a little bit better. And so we'll talk about um, some min max values as we go through this. So this guy here can do all kinds of things. We can put ground fault, short bridge tap, series faults. Um, we can put power influence and impulse noise, cross battery, you know, pretty much simulate everything that we would see in the field. In future videos, um, in coming up videos, I will be giving doing um, some of the uh, more advanced type of testing, and we'll set up some uh, some different scenarios on this and get into some not only identifying the uh, the faults, but actually going out using the meter and a resistive fault locate and a K test and things like that to um, actually locate where they're at. There, there's a natural progression or or a sequence that you can run the test. And the first test that we always need to run is voltage. And so this meter is set up so that as you swipe through the screen or up at the top here, that is the correct sequence. So if you just follow those tabs, you can also um, hit the buttons down here and just slide between them. You can swipe it. The first test we need to run is voltage. Why? Well, if we got voltage on the line, we're done. All right, so as you go through this progression and as you, you know, continue on your test, as soon as you find an issue, you're done. You got to go fix that issue. You can't go to the next test. If you do, that test is going to be skewed by the results of the first test. So in other words, if we have voltage on the line and move into, um, into the ohms reading, we're going to have a different issue, right? And it's not going to be an accurate test. So the first test, voltage. It runs through in the snapshot mode that we're in. It runs through, it does the tip and ring, so the relays close and test that. Opens up, tests the tip to ground, then the ring to ground. Standard hookup, black on tip, red on ring, green on ground, or shield. Um, in your AC voltage, you have what we recommend you see, if you want a, um, a solid running circuit, is no greater than three volts on your tip to ring, 10 volts on tip to ground, and 10 volts on ring to ground would be allowable for AC. That is going to be inducted voltage, all right? If you see anything higher than that number, um, you, you gotta go fix that, there's a problem with it. From DC, we have one volt, one volt, one volt. 
If you see more than one volt of DC on this on this copper, it's touching another pair and it's called foreign voltage or cross battery. All right, it doesn't belong there. We gotta go fix that. Moving on to the ohms. This meter is a giga ohm meter. It reads up to uh, 1000 mega ohms or a giga ohm. It's reading right now at greater than 999 mega ohms. The greater than means that it's out of range. There could be a 1.1 giga ohm fault on here, but we can't see it because the meter can't read it. This is just like your uh, fluke meters and things like that, and your Klein meters. And you know, at home, you go out, you know, south wire. You take that out. You measure something, and it says OL out of limits. It's same as what this is telling us. Okay. This number, we should have no contact between the tip and the ring, no resistive faults between tip and ring. This number should be greater than, um, it's gonna happen out in the field, but it didn't come from the manufacturer that way, all right, with a, with a resistive fault there. So out in the field, what we wanna see here is greater than 350 mega ohms or higher. You know, ideally we're looking for greater than 999 across the board. If you see anything down in the kilo ohms or one mega ohm, you know, you gotta go fix that. The next one is the opens. So as an electronic component, a capacitor is two metallic plates separated by dielectric. So you have two metallic plates in there, and in between there is something that opposes the flow of um, electrons, right? So what will go on is these plates store charges, and based on the charge, you can actually measure that. So our outside plant copper has 0 0.083 microfarads per mile. Um, it acts as a capacitor regardless of gauge, whether you're 19 gauge, 26 gauge, doesn't matter. It's all exactly the same and they manipulate that by moving the plates closer together or further apart. The thickness of the insulation on the conductors is what they're doing to um, keep the capacitance the same. So tip and ring, 1877 feet. I'm okay with that. Um, as long as this makes this to my customer prem, I'm happy, right? These two numbers are the ones we want to watch, the tip to ground and the ring to ground. It's, it's comparing the tip to the shield and the ring to the shield. These numbers need to be within 99% of each other, within less than 1% difference, okay? So we only have a foot difference between there, which means that those conductors are the same length. If we have a conductor, you know, where they're like this, where they have a, a conductor that's longer than, than the other one, that is an unbalanced pair. Where you come in with an unbalanced pair is a left end drop, one side, you know, one side of a bridge tap still on there, something along that line. Um, so this would read up to the shield, right? And so you have capacitance, capacitance, capacitance. This conductor is open and this still measured, you know, next to the shield. So that would give you that imbalance as well. Okay. Next one up, milliamps. We would expect to see no DC current. Um, especially since we don't have any voltage on here. So remember, basic electricity, voltage is the pressure, it's pushing the electrons, current is the flow of the electrons, the volume of electrons flowing. No voltage, no current, all right? So this is good. The next thing is longitudinal balance. So there's two things in meters with longitudinal balance. In balance, this number needs to be 60, okay? If you're um, above 60 or you know 60 or greater, you're good. If you're below 60, you're bad. Now the way this one works is, remember we talked earlier about uh, voltage and AC and the uh, inductance there, that's power influence, okay? That power influence is the first number of this. That's what PI is. So power influence has to be 80 for this to work. And if you go above 80, you go into a marginal uh, range. So 80 to 90 is marginal. Anything over 90 on power influence, again, is, is not usable. So what this does is once you get your power influence, and let's call it just for grins, this is saying it's 45 dB RNC. So that's decibels reference to noise with this, and then the C filter, C message, which is our voice band. Noise. Noise for this whole thing to work has to be 20. All right, so right now, um, what you would do in the good old days is you would call up silent termination and measure your noise. You get a number there, let's call it 20 for grins. 
you would take and minus that, subtract that. So 80 minus 20 would give you 60. Your balance would be good. So again, this is like extremely good copper. There's no power influence at all. I mean, it's less than 45 dB. I mean, it, you, you just never gonna get any better than that. And the noise is less than 5 dB RNC, which is, I mean, beyond quiet, right? That's like outer space quiet. So 45 minus five is 40. It doesn't make our number of 60 or above. That makes it bad. So this, this method was good when we had analog meters, but in today's world, uh, our meters are much better. So we never use this anymore. We use what's called longitudinal balance. And this is not how long the cable or the, the conductors are to each other, right? I mean, it sounds like it, longitudinally balanced, but that's not what this is. Longitudinal balance is, simply put, the electrical symmetry of each conductor. So if you had 126 gauge conductor and 124 gauge conductor, they have different uh, resistive values on the same length. They're not balanced. They are electrically different, all right? So we're in a straight gauge, 24. This guy here, um, says that both my conductors, the higher this number is, the better you are. Now, this is one of those numbers that we see on the simulator that would never happen in the field. Um, if you see a 75, 76, I mean, that's amazing. Okay, that, that's a great uh, great longitudinal balance on a, on a pair. What this does, what this test does, is it actually, uh, the meter puts out a frequency which simulates power influence and measures how each conductor um, reacts to that and can get the uh, symmetry of the pair, all right? What this does is this tells us how good that pair is at rejecting noise, okay? The higher that longitudinal balance, the better it can reject noise. Noise is the enemy of DSL, all right? I mean, it's that simple. So the higher the number, the better. The minimum number here, again, is 60 dB, okay? Next test, load coils. Um, you know, most of the systems now, because we're pushing the edge, we're using remote nodes, fiber-fed nodes. We don't have load coils out there. Um, DSL, unless it's a smart coil, does not work across load coils. Well, it will train, but it will not work, okay? Um, if you're in a rural system and you've bought uh, cable from, you know, the, one of the Bell operating companies, one of the old Ma Bell companies, Watch for load coils. They may have taken some out, but there may have been a pit that somebody missed. So do test for load coils just to just to make sure that one's not hanging out out there. All right, and that's it. I mean, those are the those are the tests and in the numbers. Um, so again, if you go back, voltage, we want to see nothing on here. You know, three, ten, ten, one, one, one maximum numbers are uh, ohms three fifty, three fifty, three fifty. Um, one of the tests, too, that I didn't do is there's down here, there's a uh, leakage test. And that leakage test gives us a high voltage uh, number up here. What it's doing is it's putting on like 135 volts DC onto the copper and basically testing the insulation. And again, that needs to be up at 350 mega ohms on that as well. Okay. Um, so that's it. I mean, that's, that's the test. And as long as your opens are good, your... Longitudinal balance is great. You've got a good pair. So congratulations. Tie that uh, DSL down, go to the house, run your Cat5, and fire up that circuit for the customer. All righty? Again, I hope this was helpful. I hope now we understand what a good pair is and what it looks like on a test. I'll be doing some more of this with, um, we'll put some faults in here and uh, see what those look like um, on, on uh, real short videos. And uh, we'll show you how to locate those in another video down the road. So. Again, hope it was helpful. Thanks for watching. Uh, like, subscribe, you know, join us on social media. Come on over to uh, Facebook, LinkedIn. So until next time, we'll see you on the next video. Be safe.